Thank you very much, Hilal. Um, good morning. Um, I am uh, absolutely delighted to be here. I'm not using a PowerPoint. I'm wondering whether it might make sense to switch the light on, just to avoid. We can't. Oh, OK. That's fine. Let's proceed in the dark, then. Um, <laughs> um, uh, I would like, first of all, to thank Elisa and colleagues for organizing uh, the event and giving me an opportunity to contribute a few thoughts. Um, I'm uh, tasked with exploring the relevance of the uh, uh, reflections we've been developing on global environmental law uh, in relation to international investment law. And I'm not going to present a paper. Rather, I'll uh, share a few thoughts. Um, hoping I'm not going to be rambling too much. Um, uh, but I think it is, I find it uh, uh, interesting to look at this topic because I think uh, there's a widespread recognition that the environmental challenges the world faces today require not only uh, effective environmental law <laughs> instruments, but also effective ways for integrating environmental considerations in the instruments that uh, underpin uh, global trade and investment, and, uh, and I, I, not, uh, not least because those instruments can in turn then influence the set of options that states will have uh, to address uh, environmental uh, concerns more explicitly. So in this uh, exploration of uh, about half an hour, I'll, uh, I'll try and do three things. First, I'll uh, very briefly recall some of the basic parameters of international investment law. Uh, secondly, I'll give a very brief overview of the uh, prevailing patterns in debates about the interface between uh, international investment law and the environment. And third, I'll be more directly exploring where this global uh, perspective might add value, and I'll do so in four, four main points. So international investment law in a nutshell. Um, so international investment law is the body of international law that governs the uh, admission and treatment of foreign investment. Um, uh, it's primarily based on treaties. Uh, there isn't a single uh, global uh, comprehensive uh, treaty that deals with investment issues in the ways in which that exists in relation to trade. There is no institution like the WTO in relation to investment issues. Rather, there is a large number of bilateral and regional treaties that govern relations among between two or more states. Uh, and the stated aim of those treaties is to promote uh, cross-border uh, investment flows between the states, parties to the treaties. And the main way in which those treaties do that is by seeking to mitigate political risk. So by providing protections for investment, uh, uh, and thereby, the theory goes, reassuring investors that their investments will be safe uh, in, that, in, that, uh, in the state they invest in. There's a growing minority of treaties that also deals with liberalization of investment flows. Now, one interesting distinctive feature of uh, most investment treaties is that they enable, um, they tend to enable investors to bring uh, international legal action against states where they deem states to have violated their commitments under international investment law. Uh, so that uh, is primarily in the form of investor state arbitration, um, a topic that has become, uh, that has, has acquired uh, increased notoriety over the past few years here in Europe in connection with the negotiation of some major uh, economic treaties between the EU and Canada, and also in the pre-Trump era uh, with the US, the proposed TTIP, Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnership, all comprehensive trade uh, agreements that also included investment issues, and quite often the investment chapter and the investment disputes, uh, related dispute settlement uh, provisions uh, were among the most controversial in public debates. So that's, that's uh, what in a, in a nutshell, uh, international investment law looks like. Uh, there have been quite a, uh, there's been quite a bit of debate uh, for more than 15 years now on the interface between international investment law and the environment. It's very hard to do justice to that uh, broad uh, debate, but there's a couple of main, couple of uh, recurring points that have come up in those debates. One is um, whether uh, international uh, protection standards for foreign investment can get in the way of uh, environmental regulation. Uh, 
as we know, environmental measures can, and, um, can affect in an adverse way the rights of investors, for example, uh, uh, um, uh, the right to uh, adopt certain techniques, uh, use certain chemicals, uh, develop uh, a piece of land, etc., or they might otherwise reduce the economic value of an investment. So you can see how there could be a tension there between a set of norms aimed at protecting investment against uh, uh, interference from uh, public authorities on the one hand and a set of measures that are aimed at protecting the environment uh, on the other. And indeed, measures with environmental dimensions have been at stake in a number of arbitrations uh, over the years. I think there was a, an article that came out earlier this year in the uh, Journal of World Investment and Trade that counted over 100 such disputes um, uh, over the year, uh, using provisions in investment treaties such as uh, those dealing with regulatory expropriation or indirect expropriation, the notion whereby you can have an expropriation not only when the ownership of the investment changes hands, but also when a regulatory measure undermines an, an investment to such an extent that the investment must be deemed to have been expropriated, and also a clause that is uh, recurring in many investment treaties called fair and equitable treatment uh, that has been uh, at stake in, in uh, many, if not most, uh, investor uh, state arbitrations. So that, that trend has triggered a lot of debate as to whether the prospect of having to face arbitration, costly legal bills, potentially costly compensation bills, might actually deter states from taking action uh, in pursuit of environmental goals in the first place. Uh, lots of discussions about the appropriate uh, policy space that, should, that national authorities should, should safeguard, and also developments in international treaty practice, in particular over the past few years. Uh, some states have changed their approach to investment treaties and revised the ways in which those treaties are formulated to leave more space for public authorities to, to regulate, including in environmental matters. Uh, clauses such as the right to regulate clause, uh, different formulations for fair and equi equitable treatment and indirect expropriation, et cetera, et cetera. So that's one strand of the debate. Another strand of the debate has been about whether you can use uh, international investment law itself as a vehicle for promoting environmental goals. Uh, that applies to investment treaties, the formulation of those treaties. There have been clauses emerging, particularly in recent years, around establishing investor obligations or more generally establishing hortatory language that encourages use of uh, best practice and CSR type standards. Uh, also clauses um, that um, uh, uh, require uh, states not to lower their standards in environmental matters as a means for uh, uh, attracting invest uh, investment. So not to derogate from applicable national law, not to um, uh, fail to enforce uh, the uh, applicable environmental law at the national level. So treaty practice evolving in those directions. And also in relation to investor state arbitrations, we see some states bringing environmental counterclaims against investors that are bringing suits. Uh, we're seeing uh, growing engagement with arbitration on the part of uh, NGOs, and uh, including environmental NGOs, who bring amicus curiae submissions in that space. And there have been a number of questions raised over the years as to the effectiveness of that type of treaty provisions in relation to the non-lowering of standards clauses, in particular their enforcement, uh, uh, but also the effectiveness of third-party participation in investor state arbitration. So all that is a set of debates that have been unfolding, and uh, uh, so far I think we can safely say that the discussion remains very much in the realm of public international law. So there's a number of treaties, the questions have been raised about the implications of those treaties, and, and, uh, and their ability to reconcile multiple policy goals. So where does a more uh, pluralistic uh, perspective add, add some value? Uh, I think um, I think uh, the sort of discussion we're having here at this at this workshop does bring a different um, uh, perspective to the issue, uh, and and I for one believe that that really adds value to understanding what the interface between international uh, investment law and the environment is. Uh, at the same time, I'd like to flag some nuances, some some caveats, uh, following on discussions that we've been having so far, in particular yesterday. So I, I promise I will make four points uh, on, the, uh, for, on this. Uh, first point, uh, in relation to foreign investment, uh, pl the plurality of uh, re sources of regulation, national to global, is very much a fact of life. If you take uh, 
uh, uh, for example, an extractive industry project, an agribusiness project, uh, you, you can identify multiple uh, sources of regulation which will have uh, uh, an environmental dimension of, of some sort or another. At the national level, there'd be uh, national legislation on land, water, natural resources, environmental code, etc., uh, which would apply in principle to investments happening in that country. Uh, at the international level, we've been talking about international investment law, but of course there'll be there may also be dimensions relevant to uh, international human rights law, to environmental law. Uh, there will be important contractual uh, dimensions, uh, contracts between the investor and the state, between the le contracts with lenders will uh, also or may also define some of the standards applicable uh, to the investment, including in environmental matters. And then soft law instruments, uh, be it lender-based, be it industry or commodity-based, such as the Roundtable of Sustainable Palm Oil and, 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 and others. So there is a, a complexity of legal frameworks that would be at play, and that is uh, typically recognized, uh, including by uh, international investment arbitral tribunals, um, who quite often find themselves uh, having to review national law uh, or the way in which uh, public authorities applied national law. Uh, and it's also recognized in the very framing of uh, investment treaties. I mentioned the non-lowering standards uh, non-lowering of standards clause whereby states should not derogate from their own national law. Of course, ultimately, the effectiveness of such a clause in pursuing environmental goals will depend on uh, the underlying national law standards. If national law is very weak, you know, the state may not derogate from that, but actually the effectiveness, the, 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 the ability to achieve environmental goals will be, will be limited. So we're looking very much at interlinked legal fields, and so I would say in prima facie a fertile arena for exploring the ways in which different legal instruments or sets of legal instruments, national to global, will, will interact. I should say that bringing, coming back to some of the discussions we had yesterday, I've been talking about this plurality of sources of regulation, so I'll be looking at the sources rather than the destination in terms of looking at that sort of global dimension, and also uh, questions around whether sets of bilateral or regional treaties, uh, relevance of contracts and all that, uh, the, the, the relationship between that and the discussion we had yesterday about the universal, the global in general, clearly we're looking at a slightly different phenomena compared to some of the uh, instances we discussed yesterday. So first point, it is a fact of life and the, the, this plurality is a fact of life and, and also a fertile arena to look at. Second point, that said, quite often what we see in the, in, the, in the literature and also in the practice is that there are very different communities of practice that tends to fo tend to focus, tend to follow uh, these different areas of law. You'll have people who know uh, a lot about national legislation concerning land, there are people who know a lot about the investment treaties, people who are human rights experts, etc. And I would say there's actual value in bringing together these different, uh, these different perspectives and looking at these issues in a much more integrated way that is often done. Uh, and I think um, uh, part of the value of that is that it enables uh, us to identify the plurality of actors um, that, are, that are involved. Uh, in, uh, in investment processes. Uh, and I think by identifying the diversity of actors that are involved, we also see the different concerns and aspirations that those actors have, which may be crystallized or not to different extents in different legal uh, instruments. So there are issues about the normative values that are being advanced by different legal instruments. There are issues about how the different legal instruments will interplay. So traditionally, in discussions within international investment law, the key relationship has, has been framed in binary terms, as an investor and as a state. And depending on the perspective you take, you'll see the state as, either as, a, uh, as the bearer of the public interest that advances public, uh, that implements public policy through regulation, uh, or as an opportunistic predator that requires discipline through international uh, investment protection standards. But I think when we look at uh, real-life investment processes, it's, quick, it's very easy to recognize that there are quite often multiple actors that are at play. And I think the, uh, the phenomenon of uh, so-called land grabbing that we've seen over the past few years, large-scale land acquisitions in low- and middle-income countries for large agribusiness projects have really uh, highlighted that. Uh, the concern was not so much quite often the relationship between the investor and the state, but rather the impact that these large projects had on lands that were hosting precious ecosystems, so concerns about deforestation and all that, but also concerns about the rights, the land rights that people were claiming to that land, land that, may, be, uh, that may, be, may have been claimed by indigenous peoples, by different groups, um, as, as part of their uh, ancestral domain. 
Uh, so we also seen cases where uh, uh, NGOs, environmental or otherwise, brought uh, challenged in, in the courts uh, the, the award of large scale concessions and rather complex disputes that are quite often a reason in relation to this type of investments that, that, are, that are by nature multi-actor and, uh, um, and multi-centered. So I think what this what this brings what what this brings out is uh, is you know how how are these different perspectives that are quite often involved in these large scale investments uh, brought together in a legal in a legal context and I think yesterday I had the uh, I had the impression that the emphasis was on the unity at times on the on the uh, on the shared purpose that comes that flows from this notion of of global law I think it's also important to recognize the fact that while there may be synergies. Uh, between different instruments, there may also be tensions. There may also be tensions because those instruments actually respond to or advance uh, the aspirations or concerns of different actors that may be at play. Uh, and that applies to the realm of public international law itself. Um, so uh, 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 the, the, the stated policy goal of, a, of an investment treaty is going to be very different from that of an environmental treaty or a human rights treaty. And that is then reflected, has got a, se a series of uh, implications, a piece of land and, for example, we'll have commercial, but also cultural, spiritual, ecological values and the ability of different legal instruments to recognize those values varies quite a bit. And there can be a tension within that. Uh, tensions that have emerged, for example, in some of the jurisprudence of the African courts, um, of the American, Inter-American Court of Human Rights, or in relation to indi indigenous people's land restitution claims in contexts in which um, um, uh, the land had been... Uh, um, uh, was being used or have been allocated for, for commercial investments. So issues around how to manage those tensions that may exist within international law itself between investment, in environment, but also human rights uh, instruments, and also tensions between the national and the international. Even international inv investment law is, uh, is premised on the notion of establishing standards of protection of foreign investment. Uh, then one question is, how is that investment approved in the first place? What instruments that exist within national law to make sure that uh, the various considerations are properly factored in. For example, uh, impact assessment, that impact assessments are, uh, are carried out, that uh, co uh, consultations are conducted, etc., etc. Again, that was really a prominent uh, set of concerns in the whole debate about uh, land grabbing. Um, and, 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 and the fact is that in many of those investments, uh, broadly, they broadly complied with applicable national law, uh, but, the, but nonetheless they were facing l contestation at the local level because uh, uh, people that were affected by that investment perceived right or wrongly that the national law wasn't responsive enough to their concerns, didn't recognize customary rights in an adequate way, didn't require the procedures that they thought were, were necessary, etc. And so does then uh, a weak national legal framework uh, cr leave, create space for investments that once approved are then uh, protected through this international system? Does the international system if the relationship between national and, and uh, the national and the international is not properly thought through, are we running the risk that the international system is effectively compounding uh, shortcomings that are primarily rooted in national law? There's also a contractual dimension here in these sort of interactions, which I probably don't have the time to elaborate on very much, uh, but just to say that also there are uh, contractual clauses, for example, that aim to, uh, that purport to prevail over national legislation either are currently in force or, or uh, to be adopted in future, which raises issues around how environmental legislation now or in the future is going to be applicable uh, to that investment project and, and a number of issues around constitutional law, human rights law, investment law, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So second point is to say that when we look at this, um, uh, at this, um, at this phenomenon uh, through a more pluralistic perspective, we see the plurality of actors, we see the plurality of interests and that are at stake, and also the plurality of normative values and legal instruments and the tensions that may exist. And the third point, therefore, is uh, flowing from this is that I think this is an area that uh, does require attention. I, I see the interrelatedness of the actors, of the values, of the instruments as being quite often at the root of some of the more difficult legal issues that arise in the context of investment processes. And, and, and I see, therefore, value in a set of conceptual analytical tools that try to make sense of that complex reality going beyond the sort of realm of public international law alone as having value not only to better understand the phenomenon but also to try and chart 
possible ways forward. So how do you address that sort of issues? How do you engage with that complexity? And I think, first of all, there's an issue around identifying the most appropriate sites uh, for action. Uh, quite often in debates about, public, about, about international investment law, there's, uh, uh, yeah, there's a risk, I think, in trying to put too much into international in investment law. You know, investment treaties should say this, or should say that, should cover this and that. And actually, quite often, uh, some of the problems are linked, as I said, sometimes more in the weakness of national law or uh, the ways in which contracts are framed, et cetera, et cetera. And so it's you know, tailoring solutions to the best, to the best uh, policy site uh, is, 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 one, is one key um, point that comes from this. And the other one, of course, is around the coordination mechanisms. If you are, have multiple, if you recognize that you've got multiple um, sites, as it were, how are, they going, how are they all going to be playing together? Uh, and so within the space of public international law, there's been a lot of discussion, of course, about uh, systemic integration to try and read across different legal instruments, but also this, you know, look, going beyond that and taking this more global perspective, how do we reconcile the national and the international? How do we, you know, this notion of national policy space, what does that mean? Where, where is the, what are the boundaries of, uh, of reach? Of, of, of investment protection in relation to um, national policy space, what levels of what types of cross-referencing can be thought through in terms of linking investment protection to environmental human rights uh, considerations, possibly soft law instruments, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So both where is the most appropriate site for acting, and how do you make sure that action in different sites is properly coordinated in an effective way? The fourth and final point I'd like to make, and I need to wrap up within five minutes, uh, is, is, is the fact that we can all uh, think about sort of this, um, you know, there's a, a lot of technical work to be done in terms of the analysis to identify the issues, and also in terms of thinking through some of the possible ways forward uh, along the lines of what they just discussed. But I think we also need to recognize the, the political dimension that underline a lot of the discussions that we have, we've been having over the past day and a half. Um, particularly where there are different normative values at stake, particularly where there are distributive issues at stake, um, which is quite often the case in this sort of large-scale investment processes, then there are questions around whose voice counts, who is actually going to be at the table to define how to, how to manage the tensions, how to manage the trade-offs that we talked about yesterday, who is going to shape those mechanisms, and, and, and what space will those mechanisms provide for continued voice and representation, what, 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 what opportunities will there be in that? And I think, you know, the, 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 so that's, that's a, huge, a huge set of issues that obviously I don't have the time to discuss now, but just very quickly, two thoughts. One is there was some discussion yesterday about the relevance of state-centered perspective and uh, perspectives, and I think sometimes in discussions about sort of global Global law, global legal pluralism, and there's 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 a there's a, 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 a some a degree of suspicion of of state-centered frameworks, and 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 there's a, also a, a desire to go beyond uh, those frameworks. And I think when we start looking at the fundamental economic interests that shape uh, our globalized economy, I think there's also space for realizing that states actually play a very important role or can play a very important role. And uh, not only because quite often, not in all states, but at least in some states, they are the primary locus for democratic decision making, but also because the realm of non-state actors is quite often shaped by significant power relations and power, power asymmetries. Um, you know, where, where does the funding from comes from? We were discussing earlier that, you know, in, in somewhat different ways that applies also. Um, to the realm of uh, that, that, that I'm discussing now, and and the imbalances that exist in that space. So I think, you know, I would encourage us not to be too quick in dispensing with what can be an important an important instrument um, for advancing for advancing this agenda. Uh, and then, secondly, uh, a more general point about the need to uh, complement this sort of legal ingenuity, legal innovation, legal creativity in terms of designing. Uh, and implementing systems that work with also an agenda that is more around legal empowerment, sort of enabling people, enabling uh, citizens to engage with the lawmaking process in an, in, in an informed way. And I think that clearly is an, a, an, a, an arena for action, but there's also an important research agenda in there in terms of understanding how that works. You know, how do you, dis how do you disaggregate the actors? How do you understand the complex relations that exist? Uh, what, what approaches uh, actually make sense in any given context, et cetera.
So I'd like to wrap up just by saying that I think that there's a real added value that can come from applying in a rigorous way the insights from this sort of more pluralistic perspective to understanding the realm of law in relation to environment and investment processes and both to make sense of the complexity and also to try and identify ways to address that complexity in policy terms. Uh, I also think that there are some caveats and nuances that we need to bear in mind in terms of as we embark in this, in this, uh, in this enterprise, in this endeavor, and in particular I don't think we should be shying away by, from uh, recognizing the issue of plurality and also tension as an important arena for legal and juristic activity. Uh, and also the, the role of politics and, and the interplay of power and, 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 and real life interests that exist when we, discuss, when we discuss these issues and what that means then for sh framing our debates not only in technical sense, not only in terms of legal sense, but also in terms of the process that can uh, enable the law to uh, come to life and, and work in practice. Thank you. <laughs>